when he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourself to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated, prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, were not ten made clean, but the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? They said to him, then he said to them, to him, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. So Luke is very careful to tell us where Jesus is at. He's on a road that goes through the borders of Samaria and Galilee. This we could call no man's land. It is a land, an area, that a lot of people wish to avoid. Samaria does not like Galilee. Galilee does not like Samaria. Samaria thinks it's been faithful to God, and the Hebrews have not. The Hebrews in Galilee think they've been faithful to God and the Samaritans have not. The Hebrews think they have the right temple on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. The Samaritans think they have the right temple on Mount Gerizim in Samaria. Lepers are people who have skin disorders. Many of them have Hansen's disease, which is a horrible disease, kills the nerves. But leprosy also was a term that could be used for almost any skin eruptions that didn't go away. If you got leprosy and you were declared to be leprous, you had to leave your home, leave your family, you could not work, you had to leave your town and live outside of regular society. You could no longer worship at the temple or anywhere at any synagogue. You were declared unclean. Lepers could not go into town. They wore bells on their clothing 
so you could hear them coming, so you could avoid them. They would call out, unclean, unclean, if anyone was within their eyesight. That was what they had to do, was a deep shame to be leprous. All kinds of fears associated with it. People were so afraid of lepers that you were not allowed to let the shadow of a leper cross your body. You couldn't even get under their shadow because if you did, it was said that you could become infected with leprosy. You could get it too by a shadow. Of course, that's not possible, but that's what they thought. They were terrified of lepers. So lepers naturally got together and then people would leave them food and so forth Usually family members would leave them food and so forth um, and then go off. Couldn't get close. So this is the scene. There in the borders between Samaria and Galilee, Jesus walks along the borders of life. He does not view borders like we do. We see things that we want to separate people. Jesus sees people. So as he approaches this village, there are lepers on the outskirts of the village. And they must have heard about him. I don't know how they heard. But when Jesus does healings, word gets around. Or maybe one of the lepers knew who Jesus was uh, before he got sick. But anyway, whatever happens, the word gets around. And they stand at the outskirts. They see Jesus coming. And they cry out. Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Now they call Jesus Master, which means they recognize he has spiritual authority. They ask for mercy, which implies that Jesus has something to give them. They need healing. And they need the attention of God. Jesus comes to them. Most people would have avoided them and gone away. Jesus goes to them. It's remarkable. And he loves them. And this is what he says to them. Go and show yourself, yourselves to the priests. If your leprosy went away, the skin lesions clear up and they no longer ooze, no sign of them, then you can go to priests and ask to be examined. If they declare you clean, then you can go and make sacrifices at the temple and be admitted back into society. Jesus tells them, to go and show themselves to the priests before they're healed. Now, the amazing thing to me is that they do it. 
Jesus says, go show yourself to the priests, and they go. They didn't stand there and argue. Well, what's the use of that? We're, we still got leprosy. Jesus asked them to exercise faith, and they do it. They trust his word. So they go. Uh, some time on the way, they realize they're healed. At least the Samaritan does. He looks, and why? I, I, I had to try to imagine it. They had these sores. Why did they notice they were healed? And the thing that I think might have been possible is that the Spirit of God came upon the leper. And they felt God's touch on their skin. They felt the fire of God's healing love upon their skin. They felt the presence of God. And if you feel fire on your skin, you'd look down to see what's warm. And they look down, they look, and the Samaritan notices his healing. Another thing I, I find amusing about this is that Jesus tells them to go to the priests, and which priests do they go to? The Samaritan would have went to priests from Samaria. The Hebrews would need to go to priests from Jerusalem. And so I wonder if they were going different directions. I don't know. But they're going to different priests. And this doesn't seem to bother Jesus. He doesn't seem to say, go only to the priests in Jerusalem. That's where the real temple is. He doesn't say that. He just says, go to the priests. Because Jesus wants to break down the barriers that isolate people. He wants to get them together. He wants to heal them from their prejudice. So they go. The foreigner turns back to Jesus. So ten are healed. The implication is, is that nine of them are Hebrews and one is a Samaritan. I find it interesting what gets Samaritans and Jews together. Leprosy, sickness, because it brings them together and they become on the bottom the very bottom of the social scale. You can't get any lower than being leprous. That gets them together. But after the healing, they're no longer together. Do the walls go right back up? The foreigner, the Samaritan, comes back. But where are the others? I wonder if they didn't come back because, well, that's a Samaritan over there now. They don't come back. Jesus says, we're not ten made clean, 
But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner. He uses the word foreigner, which would have been the word they would have used for the Samaritan. Jesus mimics their prejudice to confront them about it. Luke is quite precise here in his language. He says the foreigner turns back. The phrase is the same phrase that's used to explain repentance. In repentance, we turn back to God or we turn around. We're going away from God, we turn back, we come to God. Repentance means to make a decision that changes the direction of one's life. So let's put that up on the screen. Repentance means to make a decision that changes the direction of one's life. Instead of going away from God, we go with God. And this is good news. Jesus' ministry is for the Samaritan as well as the Hebrews. The Samaritan repents in that he recognizes The power of God, the presence of God is in Jesus. God has come in Jesus, falls at his feet, worships him. It is an amazing scene. Jesus then says something. Get up, and in that, the the literal translation there is rise up. And you rise up when you're resurrected. Same word for resurrection, rise up. And the implication here is Jesus has the power to raise us up. And he says, get up, go on your way. Your faith has made you well. A literal translation of that passage should read like this. Your faith has saved you. That's the literal Greek. It's the Greek word soteria, which we get the word salvation, soter. It is salvation. You are saved. Your faith has saved you. In other words, you have trusted in Christ and you are connected to the power which saves you. It's caused you to turn to Jesus, and Jesus has saved him, brought him in to the family of God. The presence of God is recognized, and he is grateful. Gratitude is the right response to the action of God. When God does something, we are grateful. And so the Samaritan comes back and is grateful. The others should have come back too. Gratitude is our response to the God who saves. Uh, Anne Lamott is a spiritual writer. 
And she says when she, before she goes to sleep, she says a very simple prayer. Here it is. I think you'll be able to remember this. You ready? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's her prayer. At the end of the day. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I think that's pretty good. That's a good way to go to sleep. What do you think? I also think it'd be neat to connect thank you and thank you and thank you with three things that we could recognize that God has done in that day. And then that would cause us to be all the more thankful when we recognize what God has done for us that day. So give it a whirl. Now get this. Researchers have studied gratitude. And this is what they found. When you're grateful, your immune system goes up. Stress goes down. People who are grateful have been found to be more hopeful and full of a positive attitude. Now, the Samaritan didn't come back to Jesus and become grateful because he knew it would help his immune system to go up. He didn't come back because he knew, oh, I'll have a more positive attitude of life after if I'm grateful. He came back and was grateful because it was a response to God. And that is the best way to be grateful, to respond to the God who saves us. Now, sometimes we feel leprous. What do I mean? You feel unclean, like you're a hazard to life, like you've let everyone down, and people just ought to avoid us. You ever feel like that? Sometimes we're weighed down by the shame of something. How could I do something so stupid? All right? But know this. Jesus comes to the leper. There's another account where he comes to a leper and touches him when he heals him. No one would do that except Jesus. Because nothing can keep him away from loving us and touching us with the gift of salvation. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Amen.